having me here. I'm really appreciating this opportunity to be able to share with you um, about Taiwanese experience in incorporating the oceanic perspective. So I will be talking about one exhibit that is quite old. It's in 2005, but it um, demonstrates how the Taiwanese culture is trying to incorporate a oceanic um, perspective and how it is still an evolving process. So this is the outline. I'll first talk a little bit about this museum called Oceanic Taiwan, a conversation between the people and the island. And then we'll look a little bit at the Taiwan and its oceanic perspective, the background. And then we go in to talk about the National Museum of History and how it incorporated this idea of Oceanic Taiwan. Um, and then we will go into four perspectives in this exhibition. Um, first is the actors, and then the object assemblage, and then the exhibition narrative, and then what had been invisible in the exhibition that will tell us more about how this process is very um, evolving. And then we go to conclusion. Um, so first, um, in 2005, the National Museum of History in Taiwan presented its first exhibition that took an oceanic perspective on the history of Taiwan. Um, the name is as listed above. Um, it is a breakthrough in the National Museum of History's narratological practice. It resembled the transformation of the NMH agency in national cultural representation. It is an um, exhibition complex that evolved civilian collecting communities, universities, research centers, and an oceanic narrative that attests to the transition of the museum's practice in presenting national culture. So this is actually what our museum looked like. As you can see, it actually look like a Chinese temple. We have um, visitors that come across who doesn't know that it's a museum, try to bow to our museum. So you could kind of see what this museum is. It wanted to represent a traditional Chinese culture. So this is very different from an oceanic perspective. Okay, so this is actually a paradigm shift for this authoritarian established national museum to incorporate an to incorporate an opposite, uh, an opposite perspective to its very well-established continental narrative, which is in a Chinese perspective. Um, so this case study, we will examine the exhibition network of Oceanic Taiwan that reflected the challenges and opportunities from the Oceanic cultural representation for this island nation with um, a multiple settler colonial experience. So Taiwan is an island located between the Pacific Ocean and the Chinese continent. It had been a knot of seafaring and immigration and has faced continuous geopolitical conflicts and domestic identity issues. The geographical location brought waves of immigrants that traveled through the seas and with them settler colonialism. While every regime promotes a different ideology serving their needs, um, the continental originating Chinese nationalist authoritarianism that ended only half a century ago directed a cultural ecology that overlooked the island's maritime experiences. Such an ideology created a lack of connection between the dominating cultural narrative and the population's living experiences. Recently, the democratic government favored an oceanic narrative approach for its potential to incorporate multiple perspectives within its people's diverse memories, histories, and identities. So to, so to address the settler colonial structure is actually um, a way to acknowledge the population's diversity of origin and their mutual, mutual seafaring settlement experiences. Okay, and then I'll talk a little bit about the museum. So the National Museum of History is an iconic museum supporting the post-war Chinese nationalist authoritarian cultural governance. So from 1950s to 1980s, it really focused on representing a Chinese culture which doesn't really look at um, the sea perspective. 
From exhibiting to collecting, the museum accumulated a material-based cultural narrative focusing on the continental Chinese ideology and serving cultural construction purposes that resembled a colonial feature. The process by which a museum customizes gathers and redistributes objects that formulate cultural reveals a network composed not only of things, but also of various actors that together reflect its social context. Exhibitions thus resemble the fabricating of values through material assemblages to bestow new meanings and agencies to its components. In the case of Taiwan, the authoritarian governance by the Chinese nationalists after World War II was a form of settler colonialism. The end of material martial law in 1987 marked the beginning of the nation's transformation toward democracy and also is the beginning of decolonizing approaches. So from political structure to cultural narratives, the oppressed majority, the Han settlers, begin to gain prominence in the governing system. So if you could look at the chart over there, you can see from the 1995, there is this cross between the green line and the blue line. That green line represents the population percentage that identified themselves as Taiwanese. The blue line represent the population percentage um, considering themselves as Chinese. So before 1990s, a lot of the population kind of a I couldn't say majority, but uh, it overwhelms the population um, of Taiwanese that they consider themselves as Chinese, which is not true because um, the post-war Chinese nationalist government is only 10 million, um, as opposed to the Taiwanese population is about 5 million. Oh, sorry. So in 2000, Taiwan welcomed its first political party alteration in presidency. It was also a decade after the 1990s, which we talked about, when democratization, economic development, and the change in geopolitical situation generated a substantial cultural reorientation. This milestone of democratization also marked the fall of the post-war Chinese settler colonial structure over the island's indigenous population. So including the aboriginals and a variety of previous Han settlers. So an oceanic perspective, in contrast to the authoritarian imposed continental cultural narrative, became a prominent approach to reconstructing a Taiwanese cultural history. Okay, so the Oceanic Taiwan exhibition is composed of um, four um, perspectives that we're going to talk about. It actually is a compound of evidence that attests to the National Museum of History's agency um, in transforming from affirming a continental Chinese narrative to inspiring an oceanic Taiwanese perspective. So the actor network theory inspires this um, way for us to examine this exhibition and it helps us to unpack the multi-layered meaning making process of national museum collections. Um, the exhibition complex of Oceanic Taiwan can thus provide insights into what the transition of the NMHS agency um, represented. So first, let's look into the actors. So among the many actors involved in Oceanic Taiwan, the National Museum of History coordinated and provided the venue. The cultural administration structure in Taiwan frames its museum in a hierarchical ladder in which museums take direct command from the government. So the change of ruling party from the Chinese nationalist KMT to the indigenous party in 2000 began this reorientation of national doctrine in Taiwan. The DPP, as opposed to the KMT, promoted an ideology distinct from the previous authoritarian continental construct. So in addition to the Oh, wait, I need to <laughs> introduce the museum. So if you look at the upper right, that's the back of our museum. And it actually represents this government system that wanted to promote Chinese ideology. And if you look at the three pictures um, down below, those are also other museums and cultural institutes in Taiwan that are built up in a similar era. So you can really see how the government is trying to promote this Chinese ideology and how 
um, this Oceanic Taiwan exhibition is completely opposite to what the museum previously um, promoted. Okay, so apart from the government um, agency that we saw earlier, uh, the museum, this exhibition is actually composed of a lot of non-government actors. So in addition of those, um, they actually incorporate this architectural form who had um, collaborated with this um, university research institute who um, created this exhibition for an international platform. It was originally presented in International Architectural Biennial in Rotterdam. So it focuses on recording and, and analyzing Taiwan's coastline development that inspired an urban design concept. Also, the Council of Cultural Affairs in Executive Yuan over, oversaw the project. It kind of indicated that the government is supporting this kind of project. The other non-government actor is the Taiwan Historic Map Society and also another um, university research center who provided um, satellite pictures for the whole collection. So from the view of maps, they were actually able to visually locate the island of Taiwan in the ocean. Instead of looking at Chinese continental culture, the maps shows us that Taiwan is an island, it's surrounded by the sea and from a historic perspective to a very modern perspective with satellite visions. And then we go into the assemblage, the object assemblage, what is actually in the exhibition. So the collaborative storytelling by multiple actors were posed as a part of the nation's history when the National Museum of History launched this exhibition. The object assemblage collectively created a linear account of the history of Taiwan, focusing on its development concerning the sea. They assemble objects about the Han Chinese settlers, seafaring religion, the goddess Ma Zhu, you can see um, the down lower right, um, and then with economic activities and then the evolution of the coastal landscape in Taiwan. Specifically, the exhibition included maps, prints, ship models, photograph, postcards, and posters. You can see ship models and other objects there. So the variety of objects assembled for the exhibition could seem unmethodological at first glance. It would be difficult to identify these kind of random objects to what the National Museum of History originally um, exhibit. We were mainly focused on paintings and archaeological findings that relate us to the Chinese culture. So this is very different. This looks like everyday object. But then it together created this view of Taiwan orienting itself toward its oce oceanic activities. So um, from religious objects about indigenous Han population's maritime faith to a lot of postcards and images showing um, the oceanic practice in the Taiwanese island, it actually creates um, this vision of um, Taiwanese culture connecting to oceanic culture. And then we look at the narrative. So in the exhibition catalog, a preface uh, written by the director, he specifically stated that Oceanic Taiwan was to achieve a communication and synthesis between different fields. And then by presenting the exhibition, the museum continued its tradition of shedding light on the daily lives of ordinary people. Um, indeed, focusing on the common culture is the least provocative decolonizing narrative, but nevertheless, the prototype of this exhibition was far from just representing lives of the ordinary people. As you can see, it's trying to promote this new framework of narrating culture um, in a museum that used to promote Chinese history. So the original title of the architectural firm um, could kind of tell us a lot. You can see um, from the left picture, it's called from uh, ocean of Taiwan from nowhere to now here. So it's trying to locate a Taiwanese culture onto the island instead of trying to um, build something that is really not connected to the land the nation is located at. 
And then we look a little bit at the invisible. So what is not presented in this exhibition? So although um, this exhibition tried to reconstruct a cultural narrative in Oceanic Taiwan, there are still several missing puzzles that kind of indicates the remaining challenges for Taiwan in constructing a decolonizing and in inclusive cultural history. Um, the first is the absence of the NMH collection in this conglomerate of over 300 objects. Um, you can't really see any object from the museum's collection. All the objects are from the actors we mentioned previously are by private groups. Um, they are collected by the Architectural Forms Design Project. So the democratized government's reorientation of cultural governance kind of led to the creation of this new cultural narrative, but we still have to face the museum's limit um, in reorienting its practice that um, sits on its collection and original um, practice history. Um, second, Oceanic Taiwan uh, is evolved around a Han Chinese experience that is trying to go against the authoritarian construct of political structure, but then they don't really care about Taiwan's oceanic experience precisely, because when we talk about oceanic perspective, we think about our Aboriginal people who actually had similar language, similar cultural practices to the oceanic community. But um, it was a shame that in this exhibition, only four objects represented the Aboriginal community in Taiwan. As you can see on the slide, um, one is a portrait saying how um, Taiwanese people have Aboriginal grandmothers that we are like all mixed generation, uh, mixed gender. And then there are two um, canoes by the Lan Yu people, um, which kind of resemble a seafaring experience. But among that, as you can see, this exhibition is mainly composed of maps. So it probably is because that the museum is based on private collection, then it's bound to be restricted with personal ideologies. But um, for an exhibition that's produced by National Museum, we kind of expect that we will be able to put more perspective into it. And that will be um, our continuous um, struggle and um, task. Okay, so I will conclude. Um, through the four aspects of Oceanic Taiwan, we can glimpse the multiple change agents in creating a new national cultural narrative in this specific exhibition complex by involving decentralized actors, constructing an object-based counter-narrative against the well-established continental historiography and the transition of exhibiting narrative in accordance, the um, exhibition demonstrated an evidence switch of governing ideology from promoting sophisticated literary Chinese culture to the building of an evident-based island culture. By re-examining Oceanic Taiwan um, of its network that generated the reconstruction of a national culture, reminds us of the continuity and change in the process of cultural construction. The National Museum of History's agency um, in cultural construction demonstrated um, how Taiwanese museums are crucial agents in the nation's cultural structure and their continual production of cultural expressions reflected the unending construct of an ontological Taiwanese history. Um, so the two pictures kind of represented what our museums are doing today. It's been 20 years since the exhibition that we've been talked about launched. So now we actually have magazines that talks um, about Taiwan's oceanic experience in the 17th century. We also have some outreach programs that produce um, interesting goods for um, audiences that they could purchase, which also try to connect to Taiwan's oceanic experience. So. Oh, thank you very much. This concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. It was a great presentation and perfect timing as well. So we have a few minutes left for questions, if there's any. Des questions? Merci.
Thank you very much, Yanchen. It was really uh, in interesting, I mean, as everybody, but <laughs> uh, I didn't know about all this uh, shift in the uh, in your museum, and it, it's really interesting, especially because uh, we are working at Inumia also on our museum and how we try to change some of the ways things were exhibited before. So um, I, I was thinking that perhaps uh, trying to connect Taiwan to the islands and the oceanic perspective, that perhaps archaeology with, you know, speaking of Lapita people, because, uh, you know, uh, all the all the Pacific comes from this region and it, it might be a way also to tie links to uh, to the Pacific and it would be, uh, you might have donated a temporary exhibition perhaps or... It, Thank you. Thank you. Um, that is really on point. So uh, this museum, uh, as you have seen, is very centered on Chinese perspective. So we have to stick out, stick to our collection. So it's hard for us to dive into this topic to, uh, very much. But as a nation, Taiwan, recently we actually already have archaeological museums, which is really dedicated to archaeological references, and they really, I think they also have connection with Numia here. So as a nation, it really tried to orient the cultural narrative into this perspective with evidence, with archaeological evidences, and they talked more about Aboriginal people's culture. It really made connection, but for our museum, it's still hard because, as you can see, the building is like that. So you can't really imagine people going in and try to see a original perspective. So it's an ongoing process. Um, I'll try to work it into it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan, for your presentation. Um, in your, uh, it's it's uh, actually it follows uh, what uh, what Marion says. Um, you 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 said uh, in your conclusion that uh, there was no uh, Aboriginal perspective in the in a, within this exhibition in particular. So uh, I would like to know if there are some uh, Abor Taiwanese Aboriginal um, uh, experiences of museums uh, or cultural centers uh, that were created by themselves to to represent their own cultures on the uh, on their own. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is a great question, and that's something that we are lack of. <laughs> um, as I mentioned before, there is this Chinese settler um, structure brought by the post-war nationalists, but then Taiwan is occupied by a lot of the Han settlers who came since the 17th century. So the Aboriginal people are really um, marginalized. We do have um, Aboriginal museum, but they are established by Han settlers which are like opposed to the current, not current, are, are opposed to the nationalists, but they are still Han settlers. So they are viewing um, this Aboriginal culture in a very um, uh, similar to the Ainu, in an exotic way. They are collecting um, curious objects for themselves. Um, we don't currently have um, Aboriginal people like established museum, but we do have government supported smaller museums that give a lot of agency to the Aboriginal community. So we are trying, but we don't have um, large museums like Upopoi, um, like dedicating to the Aboriginal um, community. Oh, but I will have to say, uh, for our new, newer national museums that are established in different cities in Taiwan, they do um, di divulge into that issue more, and they try to um, represent the Aboriginal more. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Just to be clear, NMH is located in Taipei. The museum? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not a specialist. I spent two weeks in Kaohsiung in 2012. And I know I have a good friend of mine here, Ao Shen, Ao Shen Yin. And uh, just, just, uh, just um, uh, a mention, uh, Kaohsiung um, is uh, the... I'm not a specialist. Kaohsiung is the second city after Taipei. And Kaohsiung, a museum uh, of arts, have a specific, very important department uh, which uh, support Aboriginal artists. Um, I'm talking about contemporary art. 
and this very huge department and huge collection. And uh, it's l'équivalent uh, uh, de Musée des Beaux Arts. And I was very um, um, surprised and inspired because we are, I know uh, Aboriginal ta Taiwanese uh, is, uh, you can correct me, 2% of the, pop the whole population in Taiwan. So it's very, um, it's very thin, it's very, it's, it's like, a, because, um, but Kaohsiung, my experience is Kaohsiung, only two weeks. Uh, it was uh, like a big surprise for people like me from here. And uh, if we compare with uh, New Caledonia, how we promote indigenous uh, cultures, heritage here with the uh, um, Melanesian uh, islands here surrounded uh, us in the traditional and contemporary uh, meetings, uh, culture, exhibitions, etc. Uh, the south of Taiwan, uh, like uh, Kaohsiung uh, City and Kaohsiung Museum, I think it's very, we need all of us here and you first, uh, we need to, um, to share the, the experiences from, uh, from Kaohsiung. I think it's, it's uh, one of the cities in the, in the country uh, which, um, which do a lot for Aboriginal uh, uh, communities and about Aboriginal uh, tribes. It's like uh, the... Um, like here we have eight uh, traditional uh, areas, uh, uh, traditional languages, les, les arts coutumières. And in Taiwan, we have uh, something like very similar thing. And I know Ta Kaohsiung uh, does a lot about this. Thank you very much. Uh, I must correct. I might sound uh, that Taiwanese are not representing the Aboriginal culture, but um, I think from my perspective, I'm saying that they are not incorporating the Aboriginal culture in national history enough. So as you mentioned, in Kaohsiung, it's actually a harbor city. It's the second largest city. It's, it had a lot of resources that go into cultural institutions, but they are placing Aboriginal culture in art museum. That kind of tells something. It doesn't put it in a legitimate frame of national culture. Um, I think that's probably our national of National Museum of History should address. So yes, I I think Kaohsiung Museum is doing a great job, and we do have a lot of other museums that dedicated to these issues. And since this is 2005, so you can imagine that from 2005 in 20 years, we have a lot of more resources that went in, and we develop better. Um, narratives that are incorporative and representable for the Aboriginal people. Um, yeah, but I, I feel like there is still this struggle that we need to um, tackle to like incorporate it into our um, official narrative. Thank you. Vous avez une dernière question? Merci beaucoup, c'était vraiment très intéressant. Euh, euh, J'ai bien compris que l'enjeu, c'était vraiment la connexion entre la culture taïwanaise et l'océan. Et euh, je voulais savoir si euh, le musée prenait en compte les enjeux contemporains euh, importants euh, que sont ceux de, euh, du monde et en particulier de Taïwan, notamment environnementaux et, euh, et politiques euh, et militaires par rapport à l'océan. Yes, thank you. Yes, we um, with this reorientation of culture, we really, the government really is um, taking the oceanic perspective now. But then there is, like, we have this restriction in political structure. So if the ruling party alters, it could change its perspective to a continental um, ideology. So that would stop a lot of the um, perspectives getting into um, how to deal with issues. So currently we, we do still have a more democratic government. So we are um, incorporating the oceanic perspective in dealing with contemporary issues. And um, our government currently is trying to have a Southern approach in its um, policies like making more connections with the Southeast islands. And I'm not sure if they're making connections with the oceanic islands, but then it's not oriented toward the continent that much anymore. I think that's what I can say. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm.